Yeah. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. McGee, Mr. Stekete, and Mr. Van Koeworden. As the director of the John Hamden Institute, I'm very proud to welcome Mr. McGee in Amsterdam, and I'm very pleased to have you as a speaker at the Institute. Thank you very much for coming here tonight. I also would like to compliment you with your new book um, on food and cooking, which was translated into Dutch by New Amsterdam Publishers uh, this year. Mr. McGee has revised his book, which was first published 20 years ago. I still have that edition next to all my other cookbooks at home. And the new edition has been expanded by two thirds and in addition having been rewritten completely. A lot has changed since then. In particular, there's much greater interest in the science of cooking. Today, there's even the whole new school of molecular gastronomy, which is where our special guest for tonight, Mr. Van Koeverde, comes in. Maybe you are familiar with the infamous Dutch uh, tomato, Mr. McGee, which looks so good, but tastes terrible. You can even buy them as a delicatessen at Eli's in New York City uh, for like $10 or more. And maybe you can explain us tonight what sweet molecule in tomato is and advise us how to prepare our Dutch tomatoes in the future. And may I also congratulate you on your new column, The Curious Cook, which you started last week in the New York Times. It was a delight to read. Who would not be curious to know why garlic sometimes turns your food blue? And I hope you will continue to write these columns for the next 20 years, Mr. McGee. Uh, tonight's moderator is Hans Stekete. He's arts editor for NSA Handelsblad. And I also would like to welcome our special guest for tonight, Mr. Shilo van Koeverde. He is chef at the College Hotel and executive chef for the Stein Group. Uh, he takes a keen interest in molecular gastronomy. I really appreciate that you could take, uh, make time uh, in between your travels uh, to come here tonight. And uh, even you took an extra cook with you. Uh, so that will be promising for tonight. Uh, Mr. Stekte, may I invite you to come here and introduce Mr. McGee. Thank you very much. Thank you, Corinne. Um, ladies and gentlemen, <coughs> the late food historian Ellen Davidson once was once invited to, to appear on the TV show of the American domestic goddess Martha Stewart. He talked about his groundbreaking book on the history and culture of food called The Oxford Companion to Food and he was then asked to prepare his favorite dish. Davidson, being part English, part Scottish, chose kippers, the cold smoked herring that for two or three centuries, centuries has con constituted a very British, healthy start of the day. Kippers weren't available in the US, so he had brought his own. He folded open the kippers, put them on a plate, poured some hot water on them, and after three minutes took them out. Now what, Martha Stewart said. Well, nothing, Davidson replied. This is it. It's delicious with bread and strong tea. Well, he was never again asked to reappear on the program. <laughs> now let me read you part of a column uh, written by Heston Blumenthal for The Guardian. Blumenthal is a British chef with a galaxy of Michelin stars to his name and he tells us about a drink that is hot if you drink it from one side of the glass and cold on the other side. So how does he do it? And I, I quote, there is a particular gelling agent, and for Dickings Middle, uh, Heston Blumenthal writes, which enables us to make what is known as a fluid gel. We use it to make an almond puree, an amandel puree, for example. First, we make an almond milk by infusing milk with slightly roasted, crushed almonds, 
And then we mix the almond milk with a gelling agent and allow it to set into a jelly. Once it's set, we blitz it, this is a coke machine, to break it up into tiny little uh, globules that are so small that the mixture looks like a puree or a cream. But the beauty of this is that it has no starch-based ingredients. There's zit geen geen zetmeel in. To thicken it, um, to thicken it, it's it's very clean in the mouth and lets the almond flavor really shine through. And we apply the same technique to the hot and cold drink. If you use the right amount of gelling agent, you end up with a liquid like a syrup that isn't really a liquid at all, but rather a jelly that's been broken down into millions of little pieces. And we warm some of it and leave the rest cold. We put a divider, a divider down the middle of a glass and fill one side with the hot gel and the other with the cold gel. Then lift the divider and hey presto, you have what looks like a glass filled with a single liquid. Only it isn't a liquid, it's two fluid gels that will keep separate long enough for you to feel the difference. We could make them two different colors, but I think the dish works best if both sides look the same. So on the one hand, we have a food writer who simply pours hot water on a herring, and on the other, we have a writing chef, Heston Blumenthal, who, who has a, a chemical lab for a kitchen. They couldn't be more different. Or could they? Well, the man who links Davidson and Blumenthal is with us this evening. He is the American food writer, Harold McGee, and we are very honored to have him with us. Harold McGee not only became close friends with both men, but they have in inspired each other's work. But if Davidson was a brilliant food historian, and Blumenthal is a sci scientific wizard in the kitchen, McGee combines both approaches, history, history of food, and science. And both topics have attracted more and more interest, popular interest over the past years, and routinely fill venues like this all over the world. He's here because his book, McGee on Food and Cooking, has just been published in a Dutch translation under the title Over Eten en Koken. And the sub subtitle is An Encyclopedia of Kitchen Science, History and Culture, which says it all, really. His book is a completely revised edition of a book with the same title that appeared more than 20 years ago, after McGee transmogrified himself from a literature and astronomy student into what he himself modestly calls a curious cook. The old book was great, but the new edition has been widely received as a masterpiece. And I'm sorry to say I haven't read it, at least not completely, for which I hope Harold McGee will forgive me since it totals nearly 900 pages. It's an exhaustive work covering everything from milk biology to the four basic food molecules. It tells you why fresh meats get tender when you hang it for a couple of days and why sometimes eggs may stay soft when you boil them longer. He tells us about pickling in China and beet sugar in Germany and about the difference between Scottish whiskey with a Y and Irish whiskey with EY, although he doesn't explain us why they're spelled differently. He tells us that the French vice of force feeding geese uh, was already practiced by ancient Egyptians and why rye, roche, can be compared to LSD. He explains what happens to starch and potatoes when you cook them, and why you can enjoy a meal of beans twice. <laughs> and in the completely new chapter on fish, which was very, very small in the old book, he tells nearly everything there is to tell about preserving herrings in salt or smoke. Although I couldn't find an explanation what hot water precisely does to a kipper. That might be for the next print run. McGee's science-based method, well, the book is full of amino acids, enzymes, proteins, and peptides. This science-based method makes his book compulsory reading for everyone, both amateurs and professionals, who want to know more, or arguably everything there is to know, about what happens when you prepare food, and why food tastes, smells, feels the way it does. Yes, it's study material, 
but it's not a textbook. It's a book that you can also keep on your bedside table and read for fun. Um, you can um, look up something out of curiosity and find yourself an hour later having learned about all kinds of different topics that you didn't even know you were, were interested in. It's also a book that will make you go into the kitchen and try out Maillard reactions or different sweeteners for yourself. Although I should add, there's not one proper recipe in it. This book simply whets the appetite. Now, before I hand it over to you, Harold, I have to introduce another guest on the podium. He's already been here, but sneakily left. His name is Shilo van Koevoorden, and he's a chef, and a very special one at that. He has had a traditional education, but thanks to the world of science percolating into the world of gastronomy, uh, Shilo's cooking has been infused with the science McGee writes about. Shilo has been a chef in many places. He's lived in London for many years, and now he's the chef at the College Hotel in Amsterdam. And after Harold's speech, Shilo will join our discussion and talk uh, from his perspective on the um, appliance of science in his cookery. And then we will open up the discussion uh, to the floor. And finally, Shilo and his team have prepared something uh, and we'll let you taste some of his kitchen uh, tricks uh, all by yourself. Harold, can I hand it over to you? Thanks very much, Hans. Uh, does this sound OK? Can you hear me? Good. Uh, it's, it's a real pleasure to be here, and I uh, am most grateful to uh, New Amsterdam for bringing me and my book uh, to the Netherlands. And so thank you. Um, what I want to do, since we have lots of things, uh, this is a multi-course uh, evening, uh, I, I thought I would begin simply by giving a, a snapshot, a series of snapshots of the relations between science and cooking, both in the past and uh, now. Because there is this sense that uh, this is uh, an odd moment in the history of cooking when all of a sudden science is having this strange uh, and uh, highly publicized impact on uh, cooking. <clears throat> And um, uh, what I want to show you is that, in fact, the relations between science and cooking uh, have been strong for a long time, for centuries. They go way back. I want to just give you a very quick uh, tour of that history and then give you some samples of the dishes that are being made today in the, uh, the experimental kitchens of Spain and England. Uh, now, this is going to be a little tricky because I can't quite see the screen, so I'm going to uh, and I'm going to uh, ask for slides to be changed as we go along, so uh, my apologies for the, for the roughness. When I first published the book in, in 1984, it was considered to be an odd perspective on uh, food, uh, the scientific per perspective. And uh, if people thought about putting science and food together, probably what they saw in their minds was what you see on that slide on the right, <clears throat> a, a person in a lab coat. Uh, holding bottles of chemicals and making something that was probably never meant to be eaten by anyone, but that had a shelf life of a few centuries. Uh, not not a, a pleasant association. Uh, the next slide shows uh, the impression, public impression of science and food in 2004 when the second edition of my book was published. Uh, if we could go to the next. Uh, yeah. Uh, on the cover of the New York Times Sunday Magazine was a picture of Ferran Adria, who, is, uh, who I'll get back to, but who has been leading this movement in experimental cooking. Uh, and uh, his laboratory of taste is, uh, is the latest news. So clearly, the, the connection between science and cooking, at least in the, in the media, had changed a great deal. Uh, uh, next slide, please. It, it turns out that. Uh, as I say, this connection between science and cooking goes way back. And uh, this is a, a, uh, an illustration from an 18th century French uh, 
uh, book, and it shows a woman at a stove, and it has a little poem underneath it, and I can't quite see it to uh, quote it for you exactly, but I hope you can read at least the English translation yourselves. The words Nouvelle Cuisine appear in this uh, little poem from, eight, from 1759 or something like that. Every year there's Nouvelle Cuisine because every year tastes change, uh, so you have to be a chemist, Justine, talking to the, the woman at the stove. Chemist back then meant uh, being expert in your materials, knowing what you're working with, knowing your techniques and what they're capable of doing, and then also being inventive because tastes change and so there has to be something new. So this idea of nouvelle cuisine in fact goes way back and what, what's being talked about here as nouvelle cuisine is what we would now call classic French cooking and there was a new nouvelle cuisine in the 1970s and what we're seeing now is the what some people call the Nueva Nouvelle Cuisine because it started in Spain. Uh, the next slide uh, shows one of the, the pioneers of the application of science to cooking. Uh, this is Denis Papin, and he was a, uh, a contemporary of Isaac Newton. They were fellow members of the Royal Society of London, and uh, what he did for the kitchen was to invent the pressure cooker. Uh, that goes back to the 17th century and the understanding of the gas laws, how the pressure exerted by a gas influences the boiling point of the liquid underneath it. And uh, the members of the Royal Society, most of whom were bachelors, would get together sort of the way Americans used to, to have Tupperware parties. Uh, they would get together to have digester parties and would bring some new food to put into this machine and cook it and, and see what, what happened. And there are wonderful passages in diaries of the time talking about how somebody brought a pike, which is you know, a, a very bony fish. You put it in his machine for 10 minutes and you wouldn't know that there had been bones in it to begin with, uh, you know, with exclamation points. So, Scientists were very interested in this, this aspect of food, anyway, in the, in the 17th century. Uh, the next slide shows uh, the man who really invented the, the oven as we know it, uh, Benjamin Thompson, Count Rumford. He was uh, an American who ended up, uh, or a, a uh, yeah, an American, but he took the wrong side in the uh, Revolutionary War and so he did most of his interesting work in Europe afterwards. He's really comparable in many ways to Benjamin Franklin uh, in his uh, uh, understanding of uh, the way nature worked and his interest in public works, in doing things for the benefit of society. One of the things he worked on was a potato dryer, which is what you see there, something that would help uh, take some of the moisture out of potatoes and help them keep longer without rotting. He tried one day the experiment of putting uh, a leg of mutton in his potato dryer and thereby discovered uh, two things, that you could cook meat reasonably well in a closed metal box, which is what most of us do nowadays, and also the virtues of low temperature cooking because this potato dryer worked at, at a very low temperature. It took hours and hours and hours to be done, but the result was wonderful. He probably is the first man in history to have done a, uh, a taste test, a taste panel. What he did was he roasted a leg of mutton the old-fashioned way over the fire. He roasted a leg of mutton in his machine. He then threw a party and had the two legs at opposite ends of the room, didn't tell anyone what was going on, and at the end of the party weighed what was left of the two legs of mutton and proved that people preferred the one done in his potato dryer. So that's, that's where our oven came from. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this uh, man is up uh, on the screen to demonstrate that uh, sometimes the influence of chemistry on the kitchen is not for the best. Uh, this is the man who's responsible for the theory or the, the saying that searing meat seals in the juices uh, cooking meat at a very high temperature somehow closes off the pores in the surface of the meat and prevents the juices from, from flowing out when you then finish cooking it through. 
you hear this to this day on the, uh, on the food network in the States. Uh, it's wrong. It was disproved in the 1930s. I've been trying ever since I started writing to convince people that it's wrong, and I, I haven't succeeded, obviously. Uh, so, uh, and he came up with this idea out of certain mistaken ideas about both the nature of uh, muscle tissue and nutrition. Uh, so he has a lot to answer for. Next slide, please. Uh, this is someone who we're used to seeing in, in photographs and paintings as a, a, a grizzled old man with a beard. Uh, this is Louis Pasteur, and this is what he looked like when he was doing his really uh, important work demonstrating the existence, once and for all, of uh, microbes, of bacteria. And what's forgotten is that uh, he, he, of course, made important um, contributions to human health, uh, human disease, understanding human disease, but he started his work on food in the dairy, in the brewery, and in the winery. And he helped us understand uh, very basic uh, matters of how it is that wine develops and then undevelops, ages, and then uh, becomes overaged. And he did it with very simple experiments, as you see here, by taking two tubes of wine one with no air, one with some air in it, and then just letting them sit and watching them patiently and seeing that the presence of air has very important effects on, uh, on the chemistry of wine, and it takes days, months, years for that uh, influence to show itself. Next slide. Uh, and these are just two examples of books. Uh, the, the examples I've given you so far may seem sort of removed from home cooking, but these two books are two examples of many examples of books that were published in the 18th and 19th centuries for the uh, home cook to explain the chemistry of cooking. One from, from 1825 or so, and the other from around the turn of the 20th century. So there was plenty of writing of this kind of thing going on and plenty of interest in it. Uh, next slide. The, the reason that um, this sort of uh, dissipated and uh, disappeared from the scene in England and the United States both is kind of a long story and uh, uh, a wonderful book has been written about it called Perfection Salad by a woman named Laura Shapiro and I highly recommend that book. But we'll, we'll skip those decades and get to the revival of science in the kitchen. And it really started with Nicholas Curti. This is a picture of him from around 1969 when he did a BBC television program on the science of cooking. So 1969, he was doing what I started doing a few, uh, a few years later, and he was already reaching millions of people. Uh, he uh, was a physicist. He worked on the Manhattan Project in World War II, but he also loved food. And as he says in that quotation, he thought it was scandalous that we knew more about planets than we did about what's going on inside souffles. And so he began to do things like study souffles uh, and, and put meringues in a bell jar, the way you see him doing there, to see what kind of effect a vacuum would have on the texture of something light like a meringue. He is really the father of uh, this modern revival of a tradition of science in the kitchen that, that goes way back. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, you hear the words molecular gastronomy used a lot these days, and I just want to explain where that came from uh, because I think those words are misapplied a lot. And molecular gastronomy, again, started with Nicholas Curti. He had the idea of starting a, an academic meeting that would bring together basic scientists and food scientists, applied scientists, and chefs in the same room, and they would try to talk to each other about the, uh, the science, not of uh, industrial food production, but of fine cooking. And uh, he convinced a uh, director of the Eriche um, uh, Center for Scientific Culture, which held um, conferences on scientific subjects. He convinced this director to allow him 
to present a series uh, on this subject at his research center. But in order to do so, he had to come up with a better, more respectable title than the science of cooking. This was a center that was giving courses on cosmology, molecular biology, and the science of cooking just didn't fit. So Nicholas and Hervé Thies, who along with uh, myself were the co-organizers of this first meeting, uh, which happened in 1992, uh, came up with the term molecular gastronomy, basically as a public relations effort <laughs> to make it, to, to, to give a name to the subject that would be acceptable to the Science Research Center. And molecular biology was very current at the time. The, the, the prestige of molecular biology was, was very high. That's uh, the, the uh, study of DNA in order to understand life processes. So that really is studying a molecule in order to understand life. When it's applied to cooking, I would say that it's an exaggeration, or it, it, it doesn't really describe the level at which either cooks or food chemists think. So I think it's, uh, it's unfortunate that we still use it uh, to describe what people are actually doing today. As I say, this was an academic meeting. It was about 30 or 40 people. It was held over three or four days. There were, uh, it met uh, every other year, uh, and I think there were six or so meetings, they're, they're now defunct. Uh, and what I'd like to emphasize is that those meetings were not about doing something uh, wild and crazy and inventive in the kitchen. In fact, they were very conservative meetings. They were attempts to understand what chefs do in the kitchen and what the chemical basis for those uh, procedures were. So it was very much trying to understand uh, uh, good cooking as it existed. It really wasn't about breaking new territory. And that's another reason that I think it's unfortunate that uh, these experimental cooks who are really, uh, really creative people in their own right are being tagged with this name that, that really has nothing to do with what they did. Anyway, next slide shows uh, the, the Founding father, I would say, of this of this experimental movement, Ferran Adria, who has a restaurant in Catalonia called El Bui, and uh, I just want to show you some of his dishes and some of the dishes that uh, people who have taken inspiration from him are doing, and that'll sort of give a context for the the uh, discussion that that can follow. Uh, next slide shows uh, a, a dish that I think is really stunning. Uh, and th the basic thing that he's done here is take something like a ravioli, which is a, a little package, a dough package. It's got something nice inside, and it's got a nice sauce on top, but the, the packaging material itself, the pasta, is on its own rather bland and uh, starchy. And what Ferran said was, why can't I make a package that is uh, transparent so that you can see through it, so that you can see what's inside, and then we can make something interesting going on inside. And then also give that package flavor of its own. And I want to give it whatever flavor I want. I want to be able to make the flavor whatever I feel like making it. And so what we have here is an example of uh, a chef wanting to do something and casting about and finding the solution on his own. This was done uh, at a time when he didn't know anything about molecular gastronomy or my books. Um, he was working by himself in a small town in Spain and came up with something no one had ever thought of, which is to take gelatin, which we all know, but which uh, doesn't allow you to do things like that for a variety of reasons, and uh, agar agar which is a thickener used in Asian cooking, but we know mostly in, in the West as a material in microbiological experiments, right? You grow uh, bacteria on plates of agar agar. Well, he put agar agar together with gelatin, which no one had ever done before, and came up with something that is transparent, flexible. You can heat it. It doesn't melt the way gelatin does. 
and you can make the, uh, the envelope, the package, out of any liquid you want. He's made it here with a veal stock. You could make it with a fruit juice or chicken stock or water, whatever you want. It's a, a wonderfully flexible uh, technique, and it's a real contribution, I think, to the art of cooking. Next slide. Uh, uh, this is uh, a, a wonderful idea, too, kind of along the same lines. Uh, uh, he, he invented a way of making caviar, as he likes to call it, out of anything. And this is using a, uh, a different seaweed carbohydrate. Agar agar, by the way, comes from seaweed, and so do alginates. And this was made with alginates, and I think Shivo has made a dish for us to experience with alginates as well. Uh, alginates have the, the uh, property of not gelling, not thickening, unless there's calcium around, uh, calcium uh, in, in a variety of forms. And so what he had the idea of doing was to make a, a flavorful liquid. Here he's made it with melon, but you could make it with veal stock or whatever liquid you want. Add some alginates to that liquid and then very carefully make drops of that liquid into a bath that contains calcium. And that bath could have milk in it, the, the, the calcium could come from milk, or you can just add a, a calcium supplement from a health food store to the liquid and it would do the same thing. The drop of liquid with the alginates goes into the calcium bath. The calcium causes the uh, carbohydrates on the outside to gel and then as it sits longer and longer, it gels more and more. And so you can scoop them out at any time you want. You can scoop them out when they're like caviar, so they have a little skin and it pops and you get juice when you, when you uh, uh, bite through it. Or you can leave it in there until it's solid all the way through. Uh, and again, you can do it with anything. So it's, a, a, again, another wonderful uh, generalizable technique, a technique that any cook can make anything they want with. Next slide. This is an example of uh, another chef inspired by what Ferran has done uh, to make something very different. So that looks like a sunny side up egg, but in fact Wiley Dufresne in New York has made something uh, that is uh, anything but uh, a fried egg. The white part is a simple gel of coconut milk, so it tastes like coconut. And the, what looks like the yolk it was actually made using that alginate technique that I just described, and it's filled with carrot juice. So you're presented with a plate that looks like a sunny side up egg, and you cut into it. And the, the um, yolk, by the way, has exactly the consistency of a yolk. It's not just carrot juice. It's got this wonderful creamy thickness to it. Um, and it's, as I say, anything but a sunny side up uh, egg. I've had the same idea uh, just to show you how different chefs can use it in different ways. Uh, the white was made with uh, mozzarella and the yolk was made with uh, a golden tomato. So that's like a, a, an Italian take on the same technique. Next slide. Uh, Wiley pioneered something uh, of his own, and uh, it's really interesting, and it's a, a, a bit along the lines of Ferran wanting to make the, uh, the ravioli skin more interesting than it has been traditionally. So these look like noodles, uh, but in fact they're made out of shrimp. And it, it turns out that if you take any kind of um, meat or fish or shellfish and grind it very, very finely, into a paste, and then add an enzyme called transglutaminase, or the, the commercial name is Activa, which is used in the food industry to make these um, sort of uh, uh, consolidated hams. You know, you get little scraps of meat and you stick them together in the can by using this enzyme, which basically links proteins together. Uh, so you add a little bit of that enzyme to the, the ground up meat or fish and it makes it into kind of a dough. And then you can extrude it in a pasta machine and make a pasta that has the, the, the full flavor because it is nothing but that particular uh, meat or fish or shellfish. So you can make a pasta uh, without flour. Next slide. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, these are uh, some pictures from a, a wonderfully inventive restaurant in Spain run by the Roca family, and they're especially interested in uh, distilling aromas out of uh, ordinary things. So uh, the, the smell, the, the aroma of a food comes from volatile molecules that can travel through the air and get into your nose. And uh, what they have done here is take that basic principle and use the principles of distillation as it's used, for example, to make, uh, to make gin or to make uh, whiskey. Uh, take, take a substance and treat it in such a way that you extract off the volatile molecules, the aromatic molecules, concentrate them into a liquid, and then make them into something. So this is a, a dish that he calls oyster and earth. It's an oyster on what looks like a little pad of, of gelatin. And it, because it's clear, it looks as though it's going to have no flavor at all. But in fact, you put it in your mouth, and it's almost as if you're walking through a forest. Because what he's done is take the soil from a forest and branches of the trees from a forest, put them in a vacuum distillation machine, distill off the aroma of the earth and the aroma of the pine needles, and then concentrates them and puts them into that jelly. It's, it's a, a real, uh, just a fascinating experience because you, think, you would think that you know, putting the flavor of dirt into your mouth would not be a pleasant experience. But in this dish, it's fascinating and, and really delicious and something that I, I can still taste it uh, as I'm describing it to you. Next, please. Uh, uh, another dish that they do at the same restaurant using the same idea is to make a dish like this where all the components of it, there's a sorbet and a jelly and, a, and an ice cream, uh, they're all colorless, they're all white. And yet each of them has the flavor of something that we ex associate with a very strong color, in fact, a very dark color. So by, by um, vacuum distilling coffee, you get the essence of coffee flavor in a clear liquid. Same with chocolate and passion fruit and tonka bean. And so you're then presented with these things that look as though they're all going to be lemon sorbet. And in fact, the flavors are uh, are completely disconcerting because you expect them to be dark and they're not. Next slide. Uh, and this is a really remarkable construction. I won't go into the details, but it's, it's a little odd. It's a mushroom ice cream. Uh, but the, the really interesting part is that globe on top, which is a, a, a kind of a spun sugar, a blown, it's like glass blowing, but you do it with sugar instead of glass. And it's filled with the aroma of mushroom and with uh, smoke. So when you tap it open with your spoon, this little cloud <laughs> rises over the plate and you inhale the, these aromas and then it's gone because there's just a little bit and it goes into the air and you're left with the flavors of the, of the dish itself, which were delicious. So uh, next slide. Heston Blumenthal uh, at the Fat Duck has uh, been getting a lot of press recently and uh, for very good reasons. He's very inventive and well, as well, and this is one of his more delightful inventions. He wanted to come up with a palate cleanser, something that when you come into the restaurant, you sit down, it's the first thing you have, and it's, it sort of resets your mind so that you're ready for the experience you're about to have. He said, you know, people come in, they may just have had a bad day at the office. They may just have smoked a cigarette. They may just have gotten a traffic ticket. You never know. You want to just make them forget all of that stuff and start fresh. So this is a, a, a preparation that's done at the table as you're eating. It's a vat of liquid nitrogen, which is entertaining. And uh, what he does is he makes a, a, a meringue uh, an egg white, whipped egg white, so there's, uh, it's very light. And the meringue is flavored with three things. Uh, lime juice, which is refreshing and tart. Uh, green tea, which is astringent. And vodka, which is a good solvent uh, and, and aromatic as well. So he, he makes this uh, meringue, and then the server makes a little spoonful of the meringue, drops it in the liquid nitrogen, it bubbles like crazy, 
fumes all over the place. Uh, and then they take it out, shake it off, and present one simultaneously to everyone at the table. And you pop it in your mouth, and you eat it. And because it's very cold and very light and has all those flavors, it, it kind of shocks your mouth and, and clears it. But it also shocks your mind, because what happens, because it's so cold, it's been in liquid nitrogen, and your, your breath is so moist, you end up shooting vapors out of, <laughs> out, not only out of your mouth, but out of your nose. <laughs> and you just can't help, as you're doing this, seeing it happen all around you, you just can't help laughing. You've forgotten where you were 10 seconds ago, and you're ready to have a really wonderful and different experience. Uh, the next slide. Uh, and I'll finish with, with this, which is, uh, to me, kind of like the, the consummate turnovers, this, this is a, a work of art. This is a piece of sculpture. It's only about that big. And it's a bite. You just pop it in your mouth. And it is uh, a uh, sugar-like substance. It's something that is used in the food industries to make things like cough drops. Uh, and it, it's kind of like sugar, but a little bit different. The, uh, the mushroom cloud ball that I showed you is made from the same material. It's called isomalt. Uh, and what, what uh, Jose Andres does is he heats it up so that it's liquid. He then uses a straw and blows a little bubble into it, like glass blowing again, and then holds the straw like that and trickles into it a little bit of olive oil. And the olive oil is just heavy enough that it makes the liquid, uh, the, the bubble, which is still soft, sag and then fall off the bottom of the straw, and it closes itself off in that lovely little <coughs> curlicue of, uh, of sugar. So what you have is this very delicate, very thin-walled, uh, um, I don't know, container of, uh, of olive oil which he then uh, decorates with a piece of Malden salt. So that's a salt crystal that you see attached to the top of it. And then underneath there's a powder, and that's uh, uh, vinegar powder. And what he calls this is, uh, it's a vinaigrette without the salad. <laughs> and it's a wonderful way to experience it, because you think ordinarily, you know, a vinaigrette, if you're going to experience it without the salad, it's going to be this kind of sour spoonful of something. But presented this way, it just, it's, again, it's a bit like the caviar experience. It bursts in your mouth, you have these very intense flavors, and then it's gone. So these are some of, just some examples of the kinds of things that are going on in, in the experimental kitchens, which uh, have a lot to do with alchemy. I'm not sure how much to do with molecules. Um, and I, I think it's just a very exciting time these, uh, today to, to see this kind of openness to, to new ideas uh, showing up. I don't know how many of these will be permanently delightful, how many are just kind of novelties, but uh, time will tell, and meanwhile, it'll be an interesting ride. So thank you very much. Harold, thank you very much. Um, while listening to your performance, which it really was, um, the, the first part made re, uh, reminded me of an expression that we are really dwarfs standing on the shoulders of giants. And I never had never looked at cooks in this way, but um, obviously your book makes that clear. Um, and the second part was um, more about the high art of kitchen science. And you mentioned the word art uh, a couple of times. And uh, since I'm a journalist, I'm a professional skepticist. And I have to ask you some skeptical questions. All right. So if it's art, <coughs> what does it have to do with real nutrition? Will we all uh, at one point spread enzymes on a sandwich or activa? <laughs> 
Well, that's a, a good question. And uh, I guess what I would say is, uh, first of all, that I, I use the word art um, loosely. Uh, I think it's a really interesting question whether you can make art out of food. I mean, art in a, in a serious sense. And that would be a great subject for uh, an evening's debate. Um, as, as far as the, uh, the, uh, uh, the fact that this kind of stuff is going on and it doesn't really seem to have much to do with uh, nourishing human beings, I would say that, um, that that's true. Uh, I once tried to figure out what the caloric content of a meal at El Bouilly was, and I think it's probably a dieter's dream. Uh, <laughs> because alginates and agar-agar and things like that aren't digestible. So they're calorie-free uh, indulgences. But I would, uh, uh, the serious point I would make is that uh, there are lots of different reasons to eat. And eating to live, to survive, is one of them. But there are lots of others, and uh, lots of other reasons to make the choices that we make when we eat. So. Uh, these days, um, uh, you know, when, when somebody is eating their third or fourth Big Mac of the day, are they eating to survive or are they eating for some other reason? And if someone goes to El Bouilly or to uh, the Fat Duck and they pay a tremendous amount of money for not very many calories, they're not going there to eat to survive. I think this is really more, this is food as, um, uh, maybe entertainment, maybe art, uh, good question, uh, but it's, it's uh, to appeal to our minds, to, to give us something to think about and something to talk about and something to feel. And uh, that's, that's just a different sort of activity. Right. You, 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 um, it's already been mentioned, you just started a column in the New York Times, The Curious Cook, which I can recommend to everyone. And uh, it has an interesting um, um, uh, first uh, theme. And also on your web blog, I uh, read about something else, um, which you also um, write about in your column, which has to do with um, smells and taste. And you mention the fact that uh, you come away from a, um, a meeting where it, was, where it was mentioned to you the idea that combining two smells um, not always leads to the same uh, uh, result and may even lead to a third smell. Mm -hmm. And this has lots of, um, uh, may have lots of appliances in uh, the signs of food. Mm -hmm. um, could, could you comment on that? Because it means that every dish is different or may be different all the time. Mm -hmm. Well, and uh, even more than that, uh, I would say that uh, no two people in this room will experience a given dish in the same way. That's something that's become clear from the uh, really remarkable advances in our scientific understanding of taste and smell. And in fact, that's why I want to, the next book I want to do is a book just about flavor. Because um, we've learned a lot about how it is, uh, f well, first of all, what it is in foods that give rise to tastes and smells and then what receptors on our tongue and in our nose register the presence of those tastes and smells, and then what our brain does with that information. And it's a, it's a fascinating and intricate and surprising and entertaining and crazy set of circumstances. Um, and uh, so two things. Uh, one, I guess I've just said, which is that we know that there's such variability in, uh, in these biochemical receptors by which we sense that we can safely say that no two people in a room of 100 people is going, are going to uh, experience a given dish in exactly the same way because we have different abilities to sense different things. We're sensitive to some things and not to others. We may be completely blind to others. I mean, the, the equivalent of color blindness, but in taste and smell. And then, as you say, we've recently found that uh, if you take two foods, two stimuluses, and you present them separately, they will activate certain circuits in the brain that are repeatable, and you can track them and so on. 
If you put those two together and present them together, then those two circuits that lit up before, that are active before, become active as you would expect, but then the surprising part is that there's a third one in addition to those two. So flavor is not just additive, it's, it, it's synergistic. One plus one equals three, it doesn't equal two when it comes to flavor. And I think the more we understand that, I think that's going to give chefs a lot of things to play with. W would you uh, ever dare to uh, eat these uh, wonderful high wire acts of gastronomy blindfolded? Would I? Yes. <laughs> uh, and, and obviously, would they still work? Uh, blindfolded, uh, I would certainly do it blindfolded. That sounds like an interesting experiment, and I mm. love experiments. It would be a waste, wouldn't it? Uh, well, yeah, because the visual appeal is, is so important to several of them. But, uh, but it's also true that if you deprive yourself of one of the senses, that changes the way you experience that food. Um, and so that's why, for example, um, presenting the flavor of chocolate or of coffee in something white really confuses you initially. And that, that puzzlement, that confusion is part of the interest of the experience. Mm -hmm. we, we, we're flying on autopilot a lot of the time when we're eating. We say, we take a sip of coffee, we expect it's gonna taste like coffee, it tastes like coffee, no surprise, you kind of ignore it. I mean, and then, but if you have it in something clear, you pay attention. Are you still able to taste without all the knowledge you have? Can you just simply mindlessly eat something and not think? <laughs> yes, <laughs> all the time. <laughs> I'm sure these people are very curious to know what it is you munch away. Should we take, uh, should we take the test? Oh, actually, yeah, this is a perfect moment for that. Yeah? This is, this okay. is fantastic. Shiloh, can, no, can you? Uh, you know, I will uh, hand it out to the crowd. Uh -huh. uh, Oh, but, but you explain what it is. Okay, yeah. um, I'm, I'm going to serve five, six people. Um, uh, Beet, uh, jelly, and uh, orange jelly. Beet? Yeah. Beet and uh, orange jelly. Yeah, yeah. So we're going to do this um, nice little experiment. And uh, I'll, I'll try to hold them up without making them fall, but you'll see that there's an orange jelly and there's a red jelly. Well, it's just a piece of cheese and uh, the other <laughs> one is, um, what is it, pineapple or something. <coughs> and in fact, this is, uh, this is an idea of Heston Blumenthal's. This is something that he actually serves at the fat duck. So you're getting a, a little starter from the fat duck here. <laughs> so now what, what I would be interested in is hearing your comments. There's a microphone over there and um, the people who have tasted one can come up to um, the microphone and give us their first impressions. So when you will get this, it says on the menu uh, beet, uh, beetroot and orange jelly. So go for it. You don't know which is which. <laughs> <coughs> Zo hebben we een vrijwilliger die who zou kunnen verklaren wat hij, hij of zij net gegeten heeft. Who wants to share the tastes? Um, the, the wild stuff was the beet and the, and the other thing was the orange. That was clear. Yeah, because we used uh, for the red uh, blood orange and for the, for the beetroot we used yellow beetroot just to play uh, with your mind a little bit. And it's, it's a bit the same effect as that, um, that extra cold palate cleanser. It's something that's meant to, uh, to surprise you, to confuse you, and to get you to pay more attention to what it is you're eating because you can't take for granted anymore that things are what they seem. C can I ask you something, uh, Harold? We all know that Teflon was first used on the space shuttle and eventually it ended up in frying pans. It, will there be um, any spin-off from the uh, high-tech cooking uh, you write about and do um, for mainstream uh, nutrition 
uh, of food manufacturing? Well, uh, first I should say that the, the book I, I, the book that's out there uh, really doesn't have much high-tech stuff in it because I was so busy finishing that book, which is really about explaining uh, traditional ingredients and, and techniques, that when I was finally uh, done and able to read a few years of magazines that had piled up on my uh, dining room table, I discovered that there was all this high-tech stuff going on that I had no idea about. So I had some fast learning to do these last couple of years. Um, I think some things are going to make a big difference. And something I didn't talk about, uh, but I think will be maybe the most significant thing for the home cook, is uh, low temperature cooking, low temperature precision cooking. So uh, low temperature cooking goes way back to, well, I showed you Count Rumford cooking his leg of mutton at probably 170 or 180 degrees Fahrenheit. What's that, 80 degrees centigrade or something? Um, but uh, ideally, if you're going to cook a piece of meat, say, to medium rare, which is about um, uh, 55 or 56 degrees centigrade, then you should cook the meat at 55 or 56 degrees centigrade. But if you, because if you cook it at a higher temperature, then the outside of it is going to get overdone while the inside cooks through. So ideally, you would cook meats at the target temperature that you want that meat to end up at. And, but the problem with that is that it's easy to recognize that you've got some stew at the boil or just below the boil. It's very hard to tell that you've got uh, a stew or a liquid at 55 or 56 or 58 degrees or 61 if you want it to be medium rare. Uh, but there are now uh, what are called immersion circulators. These are uh, machines that, they're, they're basically fancy thermometers that circulate water at the same time that they measure and they keep the temperature very constant and very precise. So you basically cook in a water bath, a, a laboratory water bath which sounds crazy, but if you just think about a, um, uh, a crock pot, which instead of having an, a low and a high setting, has very precise settings all the way through so that you really can pick your temperature, uh, it, it makes a tremendous difference in the, in the quality of fish that you can make, in the quality of meat that you can make, and um, I think it'll make a big difference eventually. Right. Um, Shiloh, uh, you, you were educated in a very traditional way uh, as, as a cook, but at some point you got into touch with these new technology. Can you, can you explain to me when that was and, and what it did with you? Um, when you started uh, cooking uh, on an age of, of 16, 18 years old, um, the, you start with the basics. So um, the first time you, you thought about there is something else, when you are trying to make a hollandaise sauce, for example, where you um, e either overheat the butter or um, the egg yolks were, not, uh, were too cold, uh, vice versa. So the, the sauce was split. So you learn the way uh, to, to change that sauce back in, in, in the right uh, course. And that's when I... How, uh, how do you do it, by the way? I'm <laughs> by the book. No, um, if, 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 the sauce, uh, if the sauce is too hot, the butter is too hot, and it, it's all split, you start with a little bit of cold water, and, and vice versa. Um, if it's too cold, you, do, you start with a little bit of hot water uh, or liquid. Uh, so, on, on a very early age, uh, I realized that uh, there were a lot of tricks, there were a lot of uh, things out there uh, who could help you to be a better chef. Uh, that's the way I, I saw it. So, I bought uh, Mr. McGee's book um, in, in English a long time ago, and I, um, I learned so much because um, that's the reason why I like the book, is uh, there are no boundaries anymore. Uh, the world is, is open. Uh, uh, from a chef's point of view, the world is, is one big fridge. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and that's why I, uh, that's what I love about cooking and, and, and that's the reason uh, why um, every day as a chef you're learning because um, an old cliche is that everything has been done already. But I think uh, Mr. McGee showed everybody on the pictures here tonight that there's still a lot out there need to be discovered. And that's, from my side, uh, the greatness to, of, of being a chef. 
Right, and, and would, you, would you say we are in a historic era? Uh, my point of view, yes, because um, during the 1900s, uh, our food um, um, in, in high gastronomy, uh, gastronomy uh, restaurants were, was based on Escoffier. And um, I don't know if you, if you share that uh, opinion, that uh, people like Ferran Adria, who gives us uh, new techniques, um, and he will be the Escoffier of the, of the new millennium. Uh, time will tell, uh, because Escoffier wasn't well known when he just started. It, he became famous after a while. Right. Now, now um, Harold McGee and Heston Blumenthal and Ferran Adria just two days ago published a uh, manifest in several newspapers where they said uh, they wanted to distance themselves from uh, the name molecular uh, gastronomy, as you've already done in, the, um, in, in your speech, speech. But this was a very compelling, uh, forceful uh, statement. And uh, one of the... One of the uh, most compelling sentences uh, was molecular gastronomy does not describe our style of working or indeed any style of uh, cooking and I thought that goes a bit far um, now first Shilo uh, would you agree with that uh, statement the, ex the, the statement that the danger exists that the technique and the technology will overtake the dish as such uh, I don't. I don't think so because um, the basic will be in the end of the day, um, whatever in in a, in, a, in a restaurant a meal which is entertainment, or uh, in a cafe uh, something to eat. In the end of the day, it still will be food. Mm -hmm. So that's my answer. Yes, but who needs deep fried mayonnaise? No, uh, entertainment. Entertainment. Uh, so you wouldn't call that um, cooking for nerds. Uh, no, <laughs> no. It's, 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 um, I believe, as it's, it's, it's my opinion, is that um, you go f uh, to a restaurant or, or a bar or, or a cafe uh, to eat uh, because you're hungry or you want to be entertained. And if you're hungry, then you don't fancy fried mayonnaise now. Right. Or bacon ice cream. Or bacon ice cream. That's also a fantastic one. And can I ask you once more to comment on the statement that we are in danger that a technology overtakes the dish itself. Because apart from a high-tech age, it's also a, an age where uh, simple, slow cooking, simple food is becoming ever more popular as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, uh, there's nothing in the statement, I think, that says, the, the chef's statement, uh, that, that says that technology is overtaking uh, food and nutrition. Uh, I think because uh, the chefs would agree with what Shilo said that, that basically it, uh, once it's on the plate it's food and it's up to the person who's eating to decide what it is and whether it's tasty or not. That's really what it, what it comes down to. Um, but um, uh, uh, I'm, I, I had a really great thought there and it just slipped out of my mind. <laughs> Uh, uh, technology and food, yes. Uh, slow food. <laughs> ah, slow food, slow food, yes. So I, I think it really does get back to what I tried to say earlier, which is that there are many different reasons to make the choices that we make, and that uh, one may want to choose for most of the meals that one has uh, to eat locally and to buy organic when you can, and that kind of thing. Um, but there are times, you know, in, instead of going to see Shakespeare, you want to go see a horror movie. <laughs> yes. You know, there, there are different reasons and different phases of the mind where you're ready for a different experience. And so going to get uh, some fried mayonnaise just to see what that's like uh, might be fun. And uh, the other thing I would say is that uh, uh, what I think is going on is not so much that there is, there is this movement, this monolithic movement of the application of science in the kitchen. I think what's actually happening is that uh, the, the usual uh, categories for describing foods are falling away. And what's really important now is the chef. It's who is it who's making this meal 
and what is his or her version, uh, vision of what food and cooking are all about. And so you, on one hand, can kind of lump Ferran and Heston and Wiley and the Rocas together as being experimental, but they're all wildly different experiences and very different people. And that, to me, is the interesting part, is that what all of this really makes possible is for each of them to express something unique about themselves. How would you, uh, Sheila, call you yourself as a chef? What would your character um, be? Um, yeah, um, no boundaries. Uh, the world is your fridge. Uh, every, every day something to learn. So what, what are you going to cook for Christmas? Uh, turkey, but yeah. uh, probably probably turkey gel. No, I won't uh, cook turkey gel, but I will I will cook a turkey which I will start the day before when I start rinsing it um, uh, first, and then put it in brine, and then I will I will cook it really really slow, and uh, you know uh, those kind of things. But um, what Mr. McGee said earlier um, that. Um, the, the, the chefs he, he mentioned uh, tonight uh, are so different, but if you go to any top restaurant in Holland uh, tonight and have dinner, you will find one dish of each uh, on that menu. So that's the, the reflection of, of uh, the top layer of, of creativity uh, mm -hmm. filtering down to um, restaurants all over the world. So it's al already becoming mainstream, you would say? Uh, yeah, yeah. Hmm. Uh, yeah. So in, in your own uh, uh, restaurant, what are the dishes uh, that could um, stand? Um, we have an uh, adaptation, uh, a deconstruction, as uh, Ferran uh, uh, calls it. Uh, we, we are well known in Amsterdam for, for an adaptation of Snert, which I will have a short version, uh, a simple version for, for all of you tonight if I have enough plates, um, which I will first hand out to five people and then I will help uh, Papayan in the back uh, to finish it, uh, which is uh, an alginaat um, recipe of uh, rookworst uh, smoked sausage. Uh, it's our adaptation of a pea and ham soup um, with a hot foam of uh, dried uh, green peas. And, and normally, what, what you in the restaurant we, we serve it uh, as you normally have uh, snert on the side. You have roggebrood and uh, which is dark rye bread, and uh, we turn it into a savory ice cream. Right, and is that to produce such a dish? Is is that a routine thing to do, or would you call it the the Mount Everest of? Uh uh, to think about, yes, yeah, the Mount Everest. But if you really um, uh, know the techniques, then it becomes really simple. Hmm. Um, on that note, I would like to um, ask if there are people with questions uh, in the audience. There's a microphone there. And this obviously is your chance to ask that one question you always wanted to have answered. like. Now I know I don't have to sear the meat, but how do I have to do it in the correct way? For instance, I would like to ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, please. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, uh, uh, it's temperature, temperature, temperature. Hmm. Uh, and so searing doesn't save you from anything. Uh, in fact, it makes it more likely that you're going to overcook the, the meat, so you have to be extra careful with it, not kind of blithe with it. Um, and uh, on the other hand, searing, just because searing doesn't seal in the juices doesn't mean that searing isn't a good thing, if that wasn't too convoluted. Searing is a good thing, but it's, it, it provides flavor. It doesn't seal in juices. Right, so who can I hand the microphone? Go ahead. As a, um, a parent who struggles to keep my child interested in food, will there be any spin-offs from this technology to make um, fruits and vegetables exciting for eight-year-olds? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a great challenge to, to set to these chefs. I well, think that would be a, a wonderful application of all of this, yeah. Well, we have turkey twizzlers, isn't it? <laughs> Who else? Um, uh, 
Uh, yeah, hello. Uh, my name is Ot van Dalen. Um, I'm a, a copyright attorney, and um, when hearing that uh, this recipe was originally from El Bulli, I was um, uh, immediately thinking, uh, wasn't it? Uh, couldn't it be copyright infringement then? <laughs> now I must say I was rather terrified that I even had the thought. But um, could you maybe elaborate on the um, norms or the culture? of uh, knowledge sharing within, uh, within the chef's community and is it developing, is it changing uh, also due to the influence of science uh, recently? Uh, there have been some really interesting things going on that have less to do I think with the science than with the, the uh, sort of cult status that celebrity chefs have these days. So everyone wants to be one. <laughs> Uh, and so there are, uh, there are two things that I would say. One is that, by and large, the, the community of chefs is a very open, sharing community. I mean, uh, and especially among the Spanish. Uh, you know, Ferran could be off in his corner cranking out these crazy things and not telling anybody how he does them so that everyone would have to come to him. But instead, what he has done is publish everything in these, in these books that have very clear pictures and detailed recipes to show people how to do it. He's interested in helping advance the art of cooking in general, not just his own interests. I don't believe it for one bit. I think they're all rivals. <laughs> they're at each other's throats all the time. And the reason he publishes these books is to cut to, to um, etch them in, uh, in stone. Yeah, well, that's, that may be another side of it. That may be another side of it. But if you go to the meetings of these, uh, of these chefs, there's a meeting called Madrid Fusion, where uh, the, the Spanish chefs and a few uh, uh, people from outside the country, different uh, selection every year, come and they basically strut their stuff. They show what they've come up with over the last year. And uh, there, there is this culture of, um, of sharing, of saying, you know, if you're not big enough to show the rest of us what you're doing, then you're not very big. That's, that's the, the kind of bottom, <laughs> bottom line feeling. At the same time that that's happening, there are uh, a couple of restaurants in Australia that have become infamous because chefs there have, have gone and done uh, stages at some of these inventive restaurants and then gone back and duplicated the dishes and not given credit to the people who, who trained them and who came up with the ideas <laughs> in the first place. So along with this sharing, there is, uh, and, and by the way, this is, these people in Australia are being publicly shamed on the internet. I mean, they... So who, who are they? <laughs> so, so we can recognize them when we... Just, just Google Australia and <laughs> recipe and scandal and you'll... <laughs> right. So, so, but the serious side of this is that there is a sort of informal copyright. No, I would say it's, uh, well, copyright or... Um, but it's, it's sort of the, what is it, the copyright of the commons, you know? As long as you use it, it's fair use. If you use it and you give credit, or if you use it but you put your own spin on it, that's fine. But mm -hmm. if you copy it ex exactly and try to pass it off as your own, that's not okay. Right. Who else? Yeah. <clears throat> I, I think uh, it could be uh, quite some problem for a restaurant owner or for the industry to uh, heat meat for uh, approximately three or four hours before you can serve it. Um, because time is always money. Um, uh, if there would be a way to heat uh, a product homogeneously uh, in less time, in for example, 10 minutes, to the same temperature, uh, let's say 60 degrees, uh, would it give the same quality? So how practical is um, low temperature cooking uh, in a restaurant environment? Yeah, a uh, restaurant environment is, is where it really took hold. And uh, so, yes, it's, it takes more time, but on the other hand, it's a machine that's doing it. And the cook who would ordinarily be standing over the grill and checking it every 10 seconds can put it in a bag, put it in the water bath, put it in the back of the restaurant, and do other things. So it actually saves a tremendous amount of labor to do it that way. Uh, and as to the question uh, whether doing it rapidly uh, to a particular temperature would give the same result, uh, the, the quick answer is no. 
for the most part, no, because a lot of the flavor development that happens during cooking happens over time and not just instantaneously. So it's not that you can sort of snap a steak from raw to perfectly cooked immediately. It takes uh, time, enzyme reactions have to happen, it, and they're chain reactions too. So one thing happens that triggers another thing that triggers another thing, and all that does take time. But isn't that in the roasting process where you go to higher temperatures? I'm where sorry? The, the taste, <laughs> isn't it developed in the, the higher temperatures? Um, for example, during roasting, if uh, you want just to boil um, or to uh, heat up um, a chicken fillet, which mm -hmm. you want to heat up not over 70 degrees, for example, mm -hmm. um, you can do it in one hour in uh, the water bath mm -hmm. at 71 degrees, for example. Mm -hmm. But you could also, um, if you could do it in a, in a shorter time, let's say in three minutes or four minutes, without overcooking it, mm -hmm. um, I don't think that there will be a big difference in flavor. Yeah, but, uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. And, and so I, what I would say is uh, uh, do the experiment. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's, always the, okay. <laughs> that's always the thing because you, you may think, I, there have been many times when I've thought something in the kitchen and I've been completely wrong and I could give you uh, a lecture on just that subject. So. Uh, yeah. it, it may not seem to make sense, but... Uh, it would involve new technologies, like microwave type of technology. He, he looks like a, a yeah. candidate for buying the book, I think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 All right, who, who, who else? Well, I'd like to, to add to the question and what's been said uh, before. Um, and in general, it, 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 the, the discussion takes a quite a high-tech uh, accent. But one of the low-tech things that you can do with the kind of things that McGee has discovered is, for instance, with this low-temperature meat cooking, you can cook your meat very slowly on a low temperature and get the results of the roasting at the end. So you just take out your, uh, uh, how do you call it? To make your cranberry layer something? So a torch. Low torch, a torch. torch yeah. and you, you do the roasting afterwards. So you have both the taste of low temperature cooking and the taste of high temperature cooking, but you, you do it the other way around. So basically, knowing what you're doing can uh, improve a classical recipe. So it doesn't have to be high tech to, have, uh, uh, to, to, to profit from all the things that are being uh, discovered. So um, particularly, I, I, I read your book, I, I've already profited a lot <laughs> from it, uh, just in my own, in my own uh, kitchen. So without being a, a high tech chef and having great, um, uh, um, technology at your hands, you can use the book and one thing I would recommend, buy a, a temperature, uh, precise temperature um, meter to improve whatever you're cooking. Thanks. And what was your question? It wasn't. <laughs> it wasn't. It's, uh, it's the answer to your question about uh, searing uh, the meat. Right. Well, you all seem to be great home cooks. And, and Harold, would this be this, the, the, the kind of comment you would get 20 years ago when you um, toured with your first book? <laughs> no, the, the world has really changed in, in 20 years all kinds of ways and not, not all of them for the better, but uh, uh, certainly for me the, um, the growth of interest in, uh, not as you say, not in high-tech cooking, but in cooking, in, in food in general. Uh, among readers has been has expanded tremendously, and so, in fact, one of the motivations for re revising my book was uh, receiving phone calls or emails with questions where before I would be able to say to myself, uh, the answer to that is in chapter whatever or on page whatever. <laughs> uh, at a certain point, I would get more questions than not that I couldn't say that about. The answers weren't in there because they were about ingredients that weren't on the map 10 years before. Balsamic vinegar, for example. I'd never heard of it and Americans had never heard of it in the late 70s because it hadn't been exported before then. Uh, people were interested in more ingredients and then there was this uh, um, uh, just amazing connoisseurship that developed around certain subjects like coffee. Uh, you know, the questions, technical questions about coffee making now 
from people who just email or call up are tremendously detailed and often I don't know the answer. I have to send them to a website